Hi, my name is Alexandre Adler. I'm a PhD student at Stockholm University. And welcome to my cosmology from home talk on simulating optical systematics for CMB experiments. Very briefly, we know the CMB. It's uh, the oldest lights in the universe. And um, it's a very good tool to constrain lambda CDM using uh, its uh, two point correlation function, the so-called power spectra. And uh, inflation theory generally predicts that there is some signal in the CMB from primordial gravitational waves. And so we hunt for that signal in the BB power spectrum from the polarized fraction of the CMB sky. So today I want to talk about um, optical effects in CMB experiments and how a detailed understanding of the optical response of your telescope is becoming quickly very crucial. And how to achieve this, we need better beam models, which is a term I'm gonna define soon, and a way to propagate the systematics associated with beams to simulated sets of time order data. So uh, the, what's recorded by detectors over time as they scan the sky and how that will then propagate to CMB maps and CMB spectra. Uh, to do that, at Stockholm University, uh, led by Adrian Tuidenwürden, who's uh, postdoc now at Princeton, we developed a software called BeamConf, which enables us to simulate time streams with complex beam models and input. And recently we've expanded BeamCon to include non-ideal polarization modulators, and I'm working on including ground pickup in it. So the repository is there, and uh, the papers I'm gonna be talking about are these three. There are several CMB experiments either under construction or planned for the near future that will make use of uh, complex beam models to hunt for beam modes. So under construction, the Simons Observatory in Chile, Another ground telescope that's currently in development is the CMBX4 experiment and uh, the Lightbird space satellite. These will benefit from more numerous detectors that can integrate for uh, and long integration times. This will lower the noise. And uh, since we want to still be, we want to be more limit, we, we want the noise to stay the limiting factor in our error budget. What we don't want is for systematics to creep up. So we want to keep systematics under control through uh, accurate simulations. We want to be sure that our systematic error will be low. Uh, example of systematics error can include the absolute calibration or uh, point pointing accuracy offsets. But here we're going to focus mostly on uh, optical systematics. It's, it's being recognized as more and more important to control those systematics, uh, as can be seen by this quote from uh, the Beyond Planck mission, that today you can't disentangle your instrumental systematics from your astrophysical foregrounds. So any, any attempt to remove the foreground must think about the beam, about the instrument model and the associated beams. And any attempt to understand the instrument model must think about what foregrounds you're using to calibrate your, uh, your telescope uh, on, while it's operating. To um, characterize our telescope optics, we use beams in uh, the cosmic micro background community. And they're essentially the same as the point frame function used in optical astrophysics. The beam is the response in the focal plane to a point source at infinity. And one way to approximate a beam, much like the one on the left, would be a Gaussian. And you know, it's a it's a fairly good approximation of that uh, area pattern. However, the question becomes: okay, how good is it? How appropriate is the approximation? Do we need to go further? What happens if we don't? Uh, and what, what kind of diffraction patterns do we have is an intimately linked question to how appropriate the Gaussian approximation is. The other question is uh, about the side lobes, uh, which are uh, 
um, substantial deviation from from that uh, Gaussian or airy pattern, like um, local maxima far away from the main beam. And the morphology of side lobes, the amplitude of side lobes is a rich subject of research. Um, as a short example, I'm going to talk about work I did with uh, my advisor, Jan Goldmanson. Um, so this is the BICEP2 telescope. It has a cylindrical four baffle in front of it. And uh, this fan-like structure is called a ground screen. Now these two exist because although you're in Antarctica and the ground is pretty cold, compared to a 100 nanokelvin signal in the sky that you're looking for, you might as well be sitting inside the fire. By installing those elements, we hope to reduce or to suppress any kind of ground pickup. However, as we've seen, there's diffraction caused by this aperture, and there might be diffraction caused by this edge. So we need to model it to make sure that it's a good idea and that it's done properly. We need to characterize the level of diffracted power that will end up in the telescope, even in the presence of those uh, shielding elements. So uh, we could use physical optics to model it, but the size of the ground screen means it's too computationally costly. We cannot use geometrical optics, which is ray tracing to model it because um, it doesn't include rules for diffraction. However, in the 19th century, at the very tail end of the 19th century, Sommerfeld came up with an idea to extend geometrical optics with rules for diffraction. It's the so-called geometrical fear of diffraction. So the basic idea is fairly simple. If a ray, if a ray trace hits an edge, then a bunch of new rays are generated with rules following a number of diffraction coefficients. And uh, by creating new rays at each diffraction, uh, you can propagate them to the far field, so uh, where uh, the phase of the relative rays don't matter anymore. And at a point in space, you add up all the rays that go for it, and then you know what the amplitude uh, of the diffracted and the initial plus the initial field is at that at that place. So we did this for a two lens refractor telescope in that SPIE proceeding that's uh, on the left there. That's the article number on archive using software called Tigre Tools. Um, we had uh, those are detectors, those are lenses. That's uh, a representation of the four baffle. Through the system, we propagate using physical optics because the size of the system allows us to do that. Then we use the physical optics to result as input to a GTD simulation of what happens when we hit. Um, the ground screen, and then we sample in an elevation cut in the far field that goes from uh, the horizon to 135 degrees, so somewhere around there. And um, with geometrical optics, you would expect to see nothing in uh, the shadow of the ground screen, which is uh, represented by this dashed line here. But using GCD, we were able to explore systematically a number of parameters of the four baffle, including its uh, geometry, so the length and the opening angle of it. Uh, what happens if you add a, a curved rim to it, because flaring is supposed to help reduce diffraction by the edges of the four baffle. Um, what happens if you coat the inside of the four baffle with some sort of absorbing material, like uh, has been done for the same bicep uh, four baffle that we saw earlier what happens uh, for different detectors on the focal plane. And uh, I'm not going to go through the older results uh, very detailed because uh, the talk is supposed to stay short. But uh, you can look at our paper if you find it interesting. Again, uh, you can go back a few slides to the archive number and uh, click on that. Then we got our beams this way. Or you can get them another way. You can do just Gaussian beams. You can get the physical optics uh, simulations of beams. The question is, how does that influence the time order data? So what we, what we need to do is to get the beam map and convolve it with the sky, with the full sky, to know Wherever where your telescope is pointing, what the signal would look like. 
and convolution is expensive. Thankfully, convolution is real space uh, is analog to multiplication in Fourier space. And that's the basic idea of BeamCon, uh, which again, it's, it's not a, a bit, we didn't come up with this idea, but uh, BeamCon is uh, a good execution on it. It's a very lightweight code and it's very powerful now, thanks to uh, those extensions on the halfway plate where you're simulating effects that uh, haven't been simulated before. So BeamConv uh, was led by Alex Daffenwürden, who's a postdoc at Princeton. Uh, it has been originally developed with help from Jan Goodmanson and uh, Sasha Rowling, who's now a postdoc at Chicago. And um, more recently, uh, Konstantina Dashrifra, who's a PhD student in Stockholm, and Theo Bilby, who's a PhD student in Bologna, and myself, have helped uh, Jan and Andre expand BeamConv to include non-realities of the halfway plate, which we'll come to a bit later. Um, obviously, the polarized CMB is not just a scalar field, right? There is Q and U polarization, and since they are uh, uh, since they are just like identical up to a rotation, you can't use uh, the basis you would use just for the temperature spectrum, which would be uh, spherical harmonics. You have to extend it to spin weight. So the basis we use for the convolution in beam con is spin weighted spherical harmonics, both for the beam and for the sky which are decomposed in those spin weighted spherical harmonics. Um, the first beam comes paper uh, focused on the difference that it made if you include in physical optics models compared to if you estimated that your beam was just an elliptical Gaussian or a Gaussian. And this is what you can see in that plot at the bottom. The difference between a scan made with a Gaussian beam and alternatively an elliptical Gaussian beam or physical optics beam. And you see that um, a Gaussian approximation fits uh, an elliptical Gaussian, will do bad, will have less difference with an elliptical Gaussian than it will with a physical optics beam. As we can see, like the physical optics has 10 times as there are 10 times as many residuals in the map for the physical optics difference map than for the, the dual Gaussian difference map. They also focused on uh, the effect of side lobes. And um, they saw that having, so this is a scan of a dust map with a map with a, the appropriate mask, but you can see that because of the side lobes, pixels outside the mask will pick up some of that dust power. And that shows up also at the power spectrum level and generates significant residuals at uh, high multiples, so that's on small angular scales. But uh, our more recent paper focus stays on the halfway plate. The halfway plate is a polarization modulator made of um, either biofringent material or metal mesh. And the way it works basically is that for uh, incoming radiation represented by this uh, uh, for a vector, which is actually a uh, so-called so Stokes parameter. So I is the temperature, Q and U is the polar, are the linear polarization, V is the safer polarization. Basically, it will like modulate the Q and U polarization based on its angle. And by knowing the halfway plate angles, you can reconstruct the intensity in each position of the sky. The problem with halfway plates is that they're uh, optimized for one frequency only. And that if you want to scan for several bands with the same halfway plate or for a wide band with the same halfway plate, you need to stack several layers of birefringent materials and orient them differently with respect to each other to create a broadband model of the achromatic of the halfway plate, the so-called achromatic halfway plate. So uh, the, the halfway plate is represented by a four by four matrix that transforms those Stoke parameters. It's so it's called a Mueller matrix. And uh, here are here's the Mueller matrix for three different halfway plate models. There's a one layer one, there's a one with three layers of right fringe material, and one with five layers of right fringe material. Uh, there are two where you're scanning over two frequency bands, one around 95, one around 150 gigahertz. And uh, in the dotted lines, you can see what's the optimal factors for a so-called ideal halfway plate. And you can see that the one layer halfway plate has really trouble being optimal uh, anywhere except here and does fairly poorly in between the bands. Uh, that the three layer halfway plate does fairly good, but has those terms there that are not present for the one layer or the five layer halfway plate. 
And this is equivalent to introducing another rotation offset to your halfway plate. And that's a frequency dependent rotation angle offset. And if you see this and you think a bit about uh, the quote before about instrumental systematics and foreground being interlinked, you think, OK, how do I find the right angle offset for a particular sky component? And yes, it is important. Because if you, like different sky components have different uh, have different spectral energy distributions. So the optimal angle will be the band for one component will be, opti will be different from the, uh, for, from the angle for another component. So if, if uh, your mask is, if, if say you, you, you do your scan, then you do your component separation, but there's still a bit of dust in your CNB map or still a bit of synchrotron in your CNB map, then, and that you'd say, okay, I'm going to apply the phase shift angle that's appropriate for CMB spectral energy distribution. You will get an inaccurate, uh, you will get an inaccurate map of Q in Q and U, in the Q and U sky components. It's what we did in that uh, plot. We scanned for, uh, we scanned a CMB spectral energy distribution and gave it the phase angle shift for a dust energy spectral energy distribution. We scanned the dust sky and gave it the phase angle for the CNB spectral energy distribution. And as you can see, it generates fairly large residuals compared to, uh, those, are, those are like differences compared to giving the right, get, compared to giving like the, the right angle, the right phase shift angle for the spectral energy distribution of the component we're looking at. The other thing we uh, looked at is again, uh, the side lobes and uh, side lobes Coupled to the halfway plate not idealities, and that also ends up impacting uh, the residuals in the BB power spectrum. So on the left, you see like a PO beam that's uh, just a few degrees across, minus uh, the, so it doesn't introduce that many um, th that many uh, residuals compared to. Uh, Compared to an ideal halfway plate, but if you add if you add a side load that extends all the way to 30 degrees, you see significant systematics which are on the same level as the signal we're trying to measure. That's quite tricky. Um, coming back up the ground, I'm working on another thing for BeamConf. So this is the Atacama Cosmology Telescope in Chile, and uh, it scans the sky and has a ground screen, and behind it are a bunch of mountains. So the horizon is not flat. And depending on where the telescope is pointing, the side lobes to some level will couple to whatever terrain there is. This is called sans can synchronous noise, and it is extremely difficult to remove. You need to basically, the, the current methods is to be very aggressive with filtering on large angular scales. But that also removes a large angular scale sky signal, which might be important because uh, that R target, which is uh, which is for um, that R target, which is uh, what we'd expect from um, from uh, inflation related B mode, primordial B mode, is also important on large multiples. So we, we on very very large angular scales. So what we would like to do is to be able to be less aggressive with our filtering. I've been working on modeling that uh, scan synchronous noise using BeamConf. And hopefully this will mean we can be, we can be less aggressive with our filtering. OK, so to conclude, um, for the B-mode search, we need to understand the optical response of our telescope. It's critical. We can do this first by making better beams using new optical simulation methods uh, or maybe GTD. And then pushing those beams through simulation tools like BeamConf, where we can then see their effects on the time streams, including effects like, like halfway plate on idealities or ground pickup. Thank you very much. And uh, if you're interested, uh, you can download BeamConf. It has great notebooks and it's very well documented.